Cakers and Cookie Ears, Julia Usher here. I'm next up on Cakers Chat, so please take a look, subscribe, and share. Welcome to the SoFlo Cake and Candy Expo 2018. Let's get inside. Welcome Cakers, Bakers, and Sweet Treat Makers. This is Cakers. In this episode, we chat with Julia Usher of Recipes for a Sweet Life. She's a world-renowned pastry chef, food writer, food stylist, and cookbook author. She's best known for her elaborate, detailed 3D cookies. Creating unforgettable experiences for special people in her life is what really drives her. Her refined ability to organize and teach her methodology serves in recreating her elaborate creations. And her imagination keeps her designs ingenious. Today, I ask her... What's the difference between a cookiest and a caker? Let's check out the chat and see what she has to say. Julia, thank you so much for joining us here at the Caker's Chat Lounge at SoFlo. What brings you to SoFlo? I am actually introducing a new airbrush system this particular show, but also selling my cookie stencil line that I had here last year as well. So two products. Fabulous. Also, I would just say just a general meet up with people. It's an excellent show, tons of vendors, tons of amazing cookie and cake decorators, so it's a chance to kind of reconnect. I work in a little hole in my basement, so I like getting out of it every now and then. So. How important is it to reconnect with your cakers? I think, it's, I think it's extremely important. As I said, I kind of work in isolation. I think most of us do day to day. And so other than connecting with people online, I mean, those connections are real to a certain extent, but I think putting the physical person to the text or the message or the emails, super, it's super important. I mean, that's the most gratifying thing for me, coming to shows, teaching, meeting people. And meeting the people who buy your products and yeah. actually showing them how it actually is supposed to work. Not so much even buying the products, because honestly, that's very new to me, but just um, for me, going out and meeting people, sharing something new, kind of lighting a spark, promoting creativity, uh, that just instilling energy that's the part that really moves me like if I didn't get that feedback I wouldn't continue to do what I do and then you yourself actually get re-energized as well Absolutely. yep completely let's talk about the beginning the very beginning I don't know how far back you want to go but it's a pretty long history <laughs> <laughs> well I'm gonna go as far as back as sugar okay. Okay. okay how did you get into cooking is that what you call it? Yes, cooking. We would call it cooking. That was completely by accident, as I said in like these shorter clip things we did. Um, I had originally been in cake decorating, actually long ago. I started out as an engineer, then I went into management consulting, so I have a very technical background. Then I went into cake decorating. I had a bakery for about 10 years. I didn't really love the production aspect of it, so long story short, I, I, I thought I'd stop the bakery and start writing books so I could just focus on creating. And at the time, like the internet wasn't as developed as it is now. There weren't blogs. So the way of expressing verbally was really through books. So I wrote a, I, I intended to write a cake book because that was my forte. But at the time it was the height of the low carb craze. My cakes were rather involved, not so involved as what you see now. This was like 20 years ago, but they were pretty sophisticated for the time. And it was just not an a book that many publishers wanted to bring to market. It was too complex. And so I had written an article for a local paper about cookie swaps. And my agent, literary agent, thought, OK, this might be more saleable because it's more approachable. They're smaller. More people are going to embrace them, be more likely to do them. And plus, we could write it for any holiday. Like, cookie swaps aren't just for Christmas, but they're for anything. So that was the concept of the first book. So um, I wrote that first book. I think I need to pick up this book because, right, yeah, no, story. no, it's not yeah. that. I just, the, you just kind of blew me away a little bit. Cookie swaps are for all kinds of seasons? Yeah, so that was the premise of the book. It was called Cookie Swap, Creative Treats to Share Throughout the Year. And I wrote this back in 2009. So I had eight little cookie vignettes. And there was, of course, a Christmas one, but I had one for Valentine's Day. One just was like a summer picnic back to school and they were styled so there were the co there were the cookies in them but also like all the accoutrement for the party because I really also love entertaining and tablescaping and all that kind of stuff and so um, that book sold and it did really really well so I wrote a second book that was more focused on cookie decorating 
And so I would say that's ha why I say it was by accident was because I started out wanting to write a cake book and that was a disappointment because that didn't happen, but it turned into something different. And then, then that kind of mushroomed from there. The cookie thing, that is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's okay for that to happen because sometimes your intentions start with one thing I think so. I mean, I never thought that way. As I said, I have a pretty technical background and I am very planful. So like everything, every step of my life has been planned. But there was a point in time when I wrote those books where I said, you know what, I'm just going to see what happens. I'm just going to. And right now I feel like I'm still in that point in time where I'm trying a lot of different things, seeing what sticks, what doesn't, what works for me personally, not just what sticks in the market, what people sell and buy. But does that work with me personally? Do I like working that way? Book writing was extremely difficult for me. It's a long process. You know, it was two years to get the book out. By then I felt the topic was kind of, the subject matter was kind of obsolete. Stuff was moving really fast on the internet. And so I moved into video. So I try a lot of things, see what works, um, see what works with them, where the market's headed, but also personally. So I'm trying a lot of things. Julia, it seems like you're thinking a lot about oh, a lot of parts and yeah. you want to execute them in the best way possible, like most of us. Yeah. But when I look at your cookies and your cookie designs, and if you guys, you have a YouTube channel. Let's like, you have a YouTube channel. And if you ever get the chance to go over and just watch her work, you are extremely meticulous and so soothing to watch. Oh, thanks. Some people don't think so, but... No, you're absolutely... You know, critics, you know, the YouTube critics are really harsh, but... They don't get us. <laughs> exactly. They don't get us. It's so soothing to watch because it's methodical and it feeds anybody who has OCD. And it's like, it's really fabulous to watch something come to life and there's a step-by-step -step procedure and there's measurements I mean I personally as a mathematician is the way my like it's it just it just really it's just you know graphic it just it's part of the whole thing of being watching something that's so satisfying come together if you had a style thank you oh, you're very welcome um, if you had a style what would you say it is I would say uh, elaborate elegance would be it. I think you hit it right on the head. That is it. I have a really hard time doing cute. I mean, just I just can't do it. <laughs> so. I think that's a completely different yeah, category. But it, it is a different category. But it's... And I, and I do think people have such distinctive styles. I mean, the personality just so clearly showing everyone's work. And that's part of, again, coming back to why do you like to come to shows. I love to see what other people do because it does ignite that spark. Well, maybe I should try that. Maybe I should branch or extend that style a little mm. bit further in this other direction. Or maybe not. Maybe I stick with my core style, but I draw on some element of what somebody else has done. So I learn a lot of these shows. I learn a lot. I learn a lot when I teach. You know, I, I always pick up stuff from the students. So it's a, definitely a two-way street, all of that. Your, your cookies are super fancy first of all and it looks like there's like layers and layers and we have samples right here your cookies are super fancy and it looks like you have layers and layers upon layers of detail almost as much work as one would put into a five-tier wedding cake yeah. yeah how do you think up or dream up any of these designs that you have in front of you so i will say first off the cookies here aren't necessarily typical of my work i'm i think i'm more known for my three-dimensional sculptural work you know, big, ornate cookie constructions. But, you know, I recognize that sometimes those are too much for a lot of people. I mean, they're time consuming. They're more time consuming than a wedding cake. So when I conceived of this stencil line, these are all stenciled cookies from my new stencil line, new as of a year, year and a half ago. I really wanted it to allow even beginners to create something that looks elaborate, but isn't as complex as it looks. So these are multi-layer sets. They're like five pieces to a stencil set, but it's pretty easy to lay them down one after the other and come up with a really beautiful design, even if you're a beginner with the airbrush or with royal icing. So huge time saver, a really quick way to add elaborate design. And, and in that sense, much more practical if you're running a cookie business and having to price them out. She hit it right on the money because that time is money. So the more cookies you can pump out per se and the fancier they look, the more you're going to be able to make. The key here is the fact that you can make ornate cookies like the ones we see here, but it won't take you that much time. And you don't 
and you don't have to necessarily have piping skills. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the downside is I do a lot of these with the airbrush, so there's an investment in a tool. They can be, work with royal icing as well, but they're layered designs, so the royal icing, if you use it, has to go down in the last step, so each successive stencil lays flat. So they do often necessitate use of the airbrush, but I think people are, I think it's a fantastic tool. I, I, I honestly do, and I'm, I'm pretty new to it myself. I mean, I wasn't airbrushing a lot two years ago, mm -hmm. but when I developed the line, I mean, now I airbrush quite a lot, but um, it provides, you know, apart from stenciling, it provides some really subtle shading effects and a gorgeous, like, subtlety that dealing with even painting or piping certainly doesn't allow. So, I like it. You're a very systematic personality, and, I, and we were talking about this earlier, and the fact that you didn't study art, you didn't study cookies, you were a mechanical engineer. And if you want to go into it, I was trying to extract that of you. I said, well, how do you think? I'll tell you this. Um, half my father and half my mother. My dad was an engineer and my mom is this like really creative sort. Uh, in the sense, not so much as, as a classic artist, but very much an arranger. Like, so she did these beautiful tablescapes and presentations every holiday. Fabulous dinner parties in the 50s, 60s when we were growing up. That's when that was, that was par partying with the neighbors was in so she so I have you know I've always had a bit of a creative side and also the analytical side and I feel like you see that fused in my work like if you if you look at it the work is um, very organized it's very thoughtful I plan everything out but I, I still think that there's a good sense of color and balance and some of the art artistic elements to it I think that just comes, it just comes because I have parents that influenced me in different ways. Um, as far as mechanical engineering training in particular, I, I studied heat transfer and fluid dynamics. So nothing, um, nothing mechanical. So like it didn't help me. What is that even? Structure a wedding cake, you know. What is that? Nuclear reactors. So I was worried about like what would happen if there were a nuclear incident and how rapidly would the containment of the nuclear reactor heat up. So I did a lot of number crunching. So I'm, you know, very mathematically, you know, I'm yeah. very mathematically minded. So it's kind of like, how many degrees do you have to heat up your sugar before making buttercream or something yeah, like that? No. So that's why the science of, no, that's exactly, so that's why the science of baking is appealing to me. You know, I like that degree of precision. That's just sort of inherent to who I am. I'm glad, I'm glad that we have a cookier here at the table. My question to you is this, cookier and a caker, how are they different? Mm -hmm. Hold on to your spatulas, it's time for the Quick Mix Q&A. Your favorite color? My favorite color is brown. Favorite song? I do not have one. Name your favorite season? Spring. What's your favorite dessert? Dessert. Flourless chocolate cake. What's your least favorite dessert? Oh, wow, that's hard because they're all so good. I don't have a least favorite. Early bird or night owl? Night owl, most definitely. Two to three o'clock in the morning. Coffee? Typical. Or tea? Coffee. I'm a night owl, so coffee. <laughs> and your zodiac sign is? Sagittarius. Name a cake tool you just can't live without. Parchment pastry cone. Exactly how did you get into caking? By accident. If you weren't a caker, what would you be? Either an architect or a politician. What did your first cake look like? It was pretty basic, but it had dots, because I love dots. What do you want your legacy to be? Sharing knowledge with people and contributing to growth and learning. Cookier and a caker. How are they different? Mm -hmm. I think it's a matter of perspective. The biggest thing for me, you know, when I was making cakes, I'd always view them from like halfway across the room because people, you know, you want to look at them the way the customer is going to look at them and appreciate them. So when they walk, wedding cake, and they walk into the room, like it, does it have that aha factor? With cookies, they're appreciated at a much more, uh, not personal level, but much more minuscule or particular level. because They're just viewed a different way. Um, 
so I'm the way I design them and look at them is different. I think the skills are very transferable. Like what I do on cookies is very much what I did on cakes, just drawn in, you know, condensed. Yeah. But the way I evaluate the design, the way I look at it, the way I say, okay, that's good, it's, it, ha it's, it has a lot to do with distance to the product. I mean, that's all I can really say. I mean, I, th I still think things like color composition, structure, things that you think of when you think of cakes also apply to cookies, especially I work with dimensional cookies. That's also, I think that's also kind of a throwback to my cake upbringing too. I, I, li I like working a little bigger, I like arranging. And I may have mentioned this before, but as, as far as an art form goes, I, I, I don't think I'm classically painterly or I've never been a, a draw, you know, one who draws. My siblings are really fantastic at that. I mean, like if I were to try to get a likeness of anything, God forbid, you know, it wouldn't. <laughs> But I, I'm, I, I think I do well with spatial arrangements and configurations, which is kind of my mom's power alley. So uh, you'll see that in my work. That's actually really important. You come up with a really good um, kind of perspective of it, uh, like arranging, because you're talking about tablescapes, and that's a completely different part of our industry, like people who do sweets tables and things of this nature. And it's kind of all about also like when you're like placing flowers on a cake or like these ornate decorations i mean okay like this flower i gotta ask you what is that flower made out of this flower here yeah that's just pipe royal icing like classic like royal icing rose you same way you do a buttercream rose on a cake so that's an example of a skill that i learned making cakes i just changed the medium made it smaller and put it on a cookie you know so that's that's all the same kind of work piping work you know? make it sound way too easy so but that's pretty, that is pretty basic stuff. <laughs> Let me ask you this. As far as when students come to you, what's the biggest issue that you hear from them over and over again as far as cookies are concerned? What's the biggest cookie issue of the industry? Okay, I'm going to answer this in two ways. Okay, so I think there's a technique kind of issue, and I think there's kind of an emotional issue. And so on the technique side, I think people are frustrated because they don't get perfect results, and that most always is a consequence of the icing being at royal icing being at the wrong consistency for the task. So, you know, I, I have a kind of an ideal working consistency for whatever it is I'm doing. I might, I flood with a different consistency than I stencil with, then I, you know, the ice, then with, then different consistency for piping roses. So that's really important. And I think that's the biggest frustration people have is like, oh, my roses look really blobby. Well, it's because your icing's too loose or, wow, you know, I'm leaving tracks in my flooding and it's not really flat. It's because it's too thick, you know? So getting that down is pretty important. I think once you do that, you're kind of liberated <laughs> at a certain level. Emotionally, I think uh, cookie decorators, maybe even more so than cake decorators, are a little more perfectionistic and a little more hard on themselves. And maybe that comes from looking at things in this little microcosm and little micro environment, like everything's expected to the nth degree. And I would just say, you know, ease up because like the average person isn't going to notice it. And uh, some imperfection can be quite beautiful. I mean, that's hard for me to say because I'm very precise. And so when I see something out of place, it bugs me, you know, and I wish um, I was a little bit more free form in that respect. Um, but I do think we're really our worst critics. And I think we do a lot of comparing online that's just not healthy. I mean, again, when I started out, you know, we didn't have, we really, the internet really wasn't what it was. I mean, like I had one of the first websites. I mean, I had like one of the first digital cameras. So there wasn't this wealth of information, like always bombarding you. I, I would go to bridal magazines if I wanted to see the latest trend. And by the time I got them, they were a month or two old, you know, so. Now so much is hitting us, it gives us this perception that everybody's producing faster than you are, they're producing better than you are because they're only putting out their best possible stuff on the internet. Mm -hmm. And I think that creates, at least for me, a, sometimes a huge sense of inadequacy and like, oh, struggling to keep up. And I think that sap, for me personally, that saps a lot of energy. And I think I see that in others too. So I, my recommendation on that and what I try to do and I don't always do successfully is to kind of just really put the blinders on, really really understand what I do well and really try to cultivate that. Yeah, I want to breach the boundaries and try to go beyond that. But, you know, having some comfort in what you do and what you're good at is equally important than having confidence in that and not constantly second guessing yourself. So that's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> that's an amazing answer. But my question to you is that it's easier said than done. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's in any industry whether it be acting or if, if it would be in any art form. 
how do you do that? How do you do? You just stay away from the internet? Do you I'm not? I'm on it all the time. I'm on it all the time because I have this community-based site, Cookie Connection. So I, I have to be on there because I'm managing it. What I try to do is not dwell. I don't. I do not. What I do not do is I do not go online actively looking for what other people are doing. You know, some people get on Instagram, they'll troll, troll through all the photos and like, oh my God, so and so's doing this. Have you seen this? If you were to ask me, have you seen so and so's this or that? Chances are I haven't seen it because I just don't look that way. I'm worried about whether like somebody's put their photo in the right category on my website. I'm not looking at it from an artistic standpoint. And I do that on purpose because I, I find it really, it, uh, I find I get into kind of negative comparisons that really aren't productive. So, yeah, sometimes I'll stumble across stuff or somebody will thrust something in my feed or it comes in front of my face like more often than not. And I just have to play that little tape recording in my head that says, you know what, we're all good. There's space for people to be creative and to blossom and, you know, do their own things in different ways and not feel competitive. I just try not to feel competitive about it. And I think there's a lot of competition. I think there has been in cakes because the industry is more evolved. I think we're beginning to see that in cookies, you know, as more and more flock to it. And I think we need to ease off. I mean, I think there's a lot to be learned from everybody and and we ought to welcome that as opposed to feel threatened by it, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you should be competing with who you were yesterday, not the next person. Tell me a little bit more about the Cookie Connection. Oh, so it's a community of, actually it spawned be- when Facebook changed all its rules and made it really hard to get information out. So I thought, wouldn't it be? And also, I find Facebook's really hard to organize stuff. So you know, you have these great posts, and then you lose the thread, and it's gone. So there was a, a cookie decorator that um, was part of a Facebook group who said, "You really ought to start this a group that's different, that it gives people exposure, where stuff isn't lost, it's well cataloged." And I thought, you know, I like that idea too. And so I just pursued it. And so I found a platform that it's very customizable so it looks completely like I'm, I made it and developed it but there's a whole team of people that I just pay a monthly fee and they support the site and it's updated and kept current and because there's a whole technical aspect that's pretty complicated but it's got forums on it so people can eat, chat and ask kind of you know random questions it's got a blog where we do a lot I've five contributors to the site who volunteer time and write tutorials that are outstanding so they happen two or three times a month. I've got new tutorial content, all contributed by other people. It has a photo posting area so people can get that kind of Instagram satisfaction of seeing flo- you know, photos popping in. What else? We have live chats, um, calendars. So I've got a community calendar so people can post their events there. It's got a lot of stuff and it's a lot of work. That alone is a full-time, almost a full-time job for me. So I'm really struggling right now with managing all I do because these two products, the airbrush and the cookies, in the last year have created like an immense amount of work. I, and I, and it's coming at this, I'm sacrificing some of the like pure creative, like all those dimensional fun, extravagant cookies that I came to be known for. I, I haven't been able to do as much of that. So right now the personal struggle is kind of making all these elements kind of balance out and answered a completely different question. Like I segued into something completely different, but thank you so much for coming over to the Cakers Chat Lounge here. I really appreciate you sharing your cookie journey with us. And I'm so glad that we were able to get a cookie here here at our show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, hope you've enjoyed this episode of Caker's Chat. If you have a question or two, don't let it stew. Comment below and let us know. Hey, and give us a hug with a thumbs up and subscribe. Catch you on the next episode of Caker's Chat. Hi, I'm Melanie. And I'm Natasha. And we're the hosts of SoFlo Cake and Candy Expo. The 2018 show was amazing. So grab your aprons, because 2019 is going to be fantastic. Head over to SoFloCakeAndCandyExpo.com to sign up for our newsletter. And be the first to know about our classes and swag. And don't forget about all of our special guests. So grab your coffee and join me. And me. For Caker's Chat at SoFlo. Did you know Melanie and Natasha are offering you a special savings? That's right. Caker's Chat subscribers get 15% off general admission. That's C-A-K-E-R-S. Tickets are on sale now. See you there.